So Dan is an American who made a career in Germany. Uh, Nick, uh, you're from Italy, but you made a career in New York, and you're now uh, moving, uh, you just moved to Paris. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> I think there is something about crossing the Atlantic back and forth going on uh, tonight. Um, so, Nick, you you studied uh, architecture and industrial design in uh, in Italy, uh, and then you you moved to New York, where you graduated from the Pratt Institute. You worked at uh, as a designer as a at uh, Muka Design at Penguin Random House, and uh, of course at uh, Louis Philly's uh, studio. Yes, and you have now been an independent designer for several years. Um, Everything I said earlier about uh, the difference between people making type and people making things with type, I think you throw that all out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, your work completely blurs the, the boundaries between drawing letter form, using type, making graphic design. And uh, although I, I don't think you have different jobs, you just integrate that into all of that into your very own practice. That's uh, I guess quite so. fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the Thai Paris uh, attendees uh, have been working like crazy this week. It is all, it was all about crafts so far, like uh, sketching, understanding the construction of the letter, achieving high quality drawings while always uh, exploring a uh, new shape. And we could not have had a better first guest to, to kick off this week. Uh, you, you help them push their yeah, push their project even further and uh, raise their attention to detail even higher and introduce them to an even wider diversity mm -hmm. of uh, letter form out there. Yeah, um, thank you. It's, it's, it was perfect, thank you. Uh, and despite the rumor saying so, I'm afraid I am not the best because Nick is the best. Uh, <laughs> please welcome Nick <laughs> Misani. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thanks a lot for, uh, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Jean-Francois, also for having me. It's really a, a pleasure to be here uh, with you all tonight. I'm especially glad I'm going second because everybody's had a couple beers. So it's really the, the best slot of the night. Uh, I'm still a little bit nervous, but that's my fault for not drinking beer, but I'm gonna save that for, for after I'm done here. So. Um, I, so I, I guess I usually start by introducing myself, but I don't have to. Um, so I'm just gonna move on to just a quick overview of my background um, and a little bit about how I got into design, the type of work I'm doing now um, and the type of work I plan to be doing in the next uh, few years. I was called very detail-oriented. I assure you this presentation is not gonna be as detailed as the one we just had because I don't think I, know even a fraction of that much about typography, but <laughs> we will s try. <laughs> so um, like, like, um, like you already know, I was born in Milan, al although um, I don't have an accent when I speak English because my mother is American, so you're actually getting two Americans in one night, lucky you. Um, but I did grow up in Milan, um, and I, I did study uh, architecture and industrial design in high school. Um, my, uh, in fact, my, my family, though, are jewelry designers. Uh, my father was a, a jewelry, an Italian jewelry designer who uh, created his own uh, company, his own line of jewelry called uh, Misani Gioielli, so with my last name. Um, which it, it was really sort of like popular in the 70s and 80s in, in Milan, and I was always kind of told that that would be my kind of destiny to take over my, my dad's um, legacy after he passed away. But um, I had another sort of idea in mind, so I went into music. I actually studied classical music um, up until, well, up until all through college. I relocated to, to, the, New to the United States, to upstate New York. Am I speaking too fast or is this more, okay. I relocated to the United States. Um, when I was about, uh, when I was 17, 
uh, to study to study classical music. So I was a harp performance major um, and really focused on, I really, really loved the classical harp repertoire that I was learning in, in college. And I think that sort of put down the basis for my love of sort of ornamentation and my love for sort of laborious, complicated processes. So um, I sort of think everything is, is kind of linked together. Um, so after uh, after my my uh, after I got a degree in 2009 in classical music, that was actually the middle of a recession uh, in the in the United States, maybe even here. So you can just imagine how much work I had in 2009 with a classical music degree. I wasn't even that good. Um, I was sort of like mediocre at best. So I told myself my options here are either I play weddings and funerals for the rest of my career. <laughs> or I sort of switch something up so I can actually kind of hopefully hope to make some money <laughs> one day uh, and not live in my mother's basement. Um, so uh, I, I took a graphic design class in, uh, in college. I really loved it and I decided, um, okay, I've done about five weeks of graphic design, time to apply to graduate school. Uh, so I ended up applying to four programs, only got into one, not surprisingly, because I had five weeks of graphic design under my belt. And uh, that one was Pratt in, in New York City. Um, and there I, I did a whole bunch of weird stuff like, like one does in graduate school in an MFA program in graphic design. So that's just sort of look like that. Uh, that's something, that's an actual piece I did in a graphic design class. And it was actually one of the less weird ones of my class. Um, this was a sort of visual response to a chapter in a Nabokov uh, novel. So um, really weird uh, stuff that we were kind of encouraged to do, but really I was developing a really strong passion for this sort of stuff, uh, which my professors weren't sort of loving because it wasn't, um, it wasn't as conceptual, it was more focused on uh, form and sort of more backwards looking towards history. But you know, um, you, um, in Italian we say l'amore è cieco, so uh, love is blind, you can't, really, you can't really choose what you fall in love with. And that's certainly what I fell in love with in graduate school. So uh, because I was still in graduate school and I had to be there because I invested a ton of money in being there, um, I had to find a way to make this sort of stuff work. Um, just full disclosure, this is not my work. This is just the stuff I liked. <laughs> I wish I was as good as Bickham, but I'm not. Um, so I had to find a way to make this sort of stuff work within an academic context. So I became really interested in the role of ornamentation um, as a tool to kind of like hide or modify meaning. So I studied, I sort of explored a lot of kind of languages of ornament. Uh, I did a project, a project on sort of Victorian flower language as a way to kind of imbue meaning and communicate meaning through ornament. And uh, sort of got really into um, something that I was really drawn to with, uh, with historical type and historical ornamental type especially was how laborious it was and how much time it took to create these pieces and how, how much of a difference there seemed to be with how we consume media and content today, sort of mostly on, on online and social media. So I decided to take the visual language of social media, all the pieces to create sort of illuminated manuscripts of sorts made out of like, all those little tiny pieces. So that's all the stuff you see there is actually pieces from here just kind of recombined. I never was able to decide what to put inside the frames because any, any, everything I proposed was just not smart enough or conceptual enough. But the frames themselves uh, were, were my project. So then I did one for YouTube and of course I did one for Google also. Uh, and now they rebranded so they ruined everything. Um, <laughs> So, um, so then I started focusing on, on words themselves and um, got really into kind of how people tend to use big words in MFA programs and how that kind of obfuscates meaning itself. Um, and you can see, even though this isn't really about the type, you can see how I was already starting to become drawn to really like, you know, very ornate sort of like layouts, even within this kind of like stricter academic context. Um, later, I started becoming very interested in um, 
how uh, very kind of intricate lettering compositions only work one way. You can't really, they're not modular, you can't really take them apart and recombine them. So I decided I would try to do like just that and create like a stencil kit from one sort of piece of lettering that I, that I had done and see what other kind of weird type and, and ornaments and borders I could create from, um, from a piece of lettering that wasn't meant for that at all. So it was, it was basically consisted of a, of a set of stencils. But anyway, I'm done talking about this stuff because I talked about it a lot in graduate school and I hate trying to sound smarter than I am. So um, I'm gonna talk about the work I was doing outside of grad school, which is actually what uh, pushed me to on the path that I'm on now. So I was really into lettering and um, I'm gonna show you a really embarrassing example, but this was the first piece of lettering I did. It's awful, it's really terrible, terrible. Like the five is backwards and I didn't even realize that at the time. <laughs> but but, um, but I thought, it, I don't know, I thought it was okay at the time. Um, but I did really enjoy doing it, which made me realize I was onto something. So, um, I, cr I started using every opportunity I could to teach myself more about lettering specifically. Um, I did a, pro a personal project where I created um, ligatures uh, out of two random letters that I would sort of select randomly out of a book and see if I could get them to work. And uh, as I kind of continued working with lettering, I started becoming more interested in historical lettering especially. So kind of like going into historical documents and being inspired by them to create lettering. S we're still not at work I'm very proud of, by the way. So uh, just bear with me. It's gonna make the next work look better, which was partially my intention. Thank you. So eventually, uh, my work started becoming a little bit more polished. I started exploring visual language from different countries um, and different languages. I love working with languages that I don't understand. Um, and uh, gradually, I started. So now we're, we're into client projects, actually. I, I eventually started getting client work doing uh, exclusively, exclusively lettering while, while I was still in school. So that's another example of, this is probably my very first client project um, doing lettering and I was just about to graduate from, from Pratt. So um, once I graduated, it was time to find a job, obviously, and uh, we were no longer in a recession and now I actually had a marketable skill, or sort of. Um, so right around graduation time, I, I came across a blog post on Luis Feely's website. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Luis and her work. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about her later because spoiler alert, I eventually get the job. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I saw her post and it felt very sort of fortuitous. The timing was perfect and um, everything was lining up just right. So I sent her uh, my portfolio, which uh, you've seen most of what I sent her by this point. I sent her a really nice cover letter that I also put parts of Italian in there because I thought that would get me an in because <laughs> she, really, she really likes Italy. Um, but, um, and, and I knew that my, my lettering wasn't perfect, but I hoped she would see a potential and take, take a chance on me, and she did not. Uh, <laughs> She was, not, she was not interested at the time, and I really don't blame her. Uh, my work was really not, not at the level of her, of her studio. So, um, so she sent me a really nice rejection email, but it hurt nonetheless. Um, regardless, I was still very much committed to eventually work for her, so I uh, signed up for her SVA um, program in Rome. It's a two-week typography workshop um, in Rome that um, cost me the little savings I had left after graduate school, because it was very expensive, but um, it gave me the opportunity to actually meet her. Uh, that's her right in the middle, obviously, and that's me. I had a lot more hair at the time. Um, but uh, it gave me a, an opportunity to meet her, to learn from her, and also kind of demonstrate that I would be capable of learning from her as well. I kind of thought of it as a very expensive two-week interview. Um, <laughs> but hey, it worked. Um, <laughs> though it didn't work right away. She still didn't have an opening. She had already hired someone. So I ended up taking a job at Penguin Random House where I designed book covers for the next year and a half under Paul Buckley, still in New York City. And uh, book covers, 
ended up being working in book covers ended up being the perfect the perfect job right out of school um, I don't know how many of you have experience working with publishing and working with book covers but they really are sort of like the perfect design exercise you have to communicate you have to think metaphorically and communicate an original uh, idea uh, you communicate sort of distill a complex work into one original image that's uh, attractive and captivating uh, and I can, can also sell. So it's, it's quite, quite a challenge. Um, and I was able to experiment with ma many different styles of typography and, um, and lettering. So um, that was really a, an excellent formative part of, of my career. Um, so I'm really glad that, I'm not really glad, I'm pretty glad that she didn't have an opening when she didn't. Um, and this is the very last book cover I designed before give, giving notice at, um, at Penguin Random House, which is fitting because I gave notice um, once I received an email from Luis saying, my senior designer just quit. Uh, do you want to talk about working here again? And of course I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I look pretty happy with myself there. <laughs> um, so there I am. Uh, I, it's not my first day, but it's like early on, I can tell because my desk didn't look that neat for long. Uh, but that was me when I first started. And the three and a half years that I spent as Luis's, well, first junior and then her senior designer were uh, probably the most formative, amazing experience I've had as, as, as a designer. And over those years we worked on, we worked very closely on a lot of different projects together and I really got, um, I really had the, the pleasure of learning so much from her. So um, I should talk a little bit about Luis though, for those who don't know. Luis is a, a designer based in New York City. She has a very small studio of uh, two, two designers, uh, a junior designer and a senior designer. And she specializes in, um, she specializes in high-end sort of branding, especially for the food industry. A lot of her work is inspired by history um, and is, uh, focuses on sort of uh, European especially, and especially Italian sort of visual language. And, um, and it was really a treat to work for her on a variety of projects from sort of book covers inspired by kind of Victorian wood typography to a much simpler um, um, art deco, like futurist, um, futurist wood type. This was, this was a typeface we designed for Hamilton, for the Hamilton Wood Type Museum. Um, in the States uh, that was actually made into wood types. So that was a really awesome project to work, on, to work on with her. And those are my initials that she gave me as like a parting gift when I left the studio. Yeah, I know, huh? <laughs> uh, um, but again, logos were really her bread and butter. Um, and this was, this, was a, this was a logo for a, an Italian French fusion restaurant in the Flatiron distri District of Manhattan where we really leaned into the Art Nouveau, uh, Art Nouveau feel for this one. Always trying to kind of put something modern or something a little bit fresher in, but definitely still very much referencing design history. Uh, this was another one of her um, a really good project we worked on together. This was my first project in her studio. It's a logo for a, another Italian restaurant in the West Village, also in New York City, that was inspired by early 20th century Italian posters. Um, and this was a, uh, the, the guys I, I had a workshop with today um, know all about this logo, but <laughs> they know it all too well. This was a, uh, a logo for a uh, very fancy French restaurant in Midtown, which closed. Uh, a few, like maybe a year after it opened, uh, but we were ga able to get one good meal out of it, so that was still pretty awesome. Uh, I did a lot of packaging while working at Luis's, um, both in sort of all imaginable sort of historical styles, and uh, this was another really fun project we worked on together. This was a poster that ended up going uh, in the New York City subway system, uh, inspired by a, an old, uh, an old chocolate package. This was probably my favorite project, and I'm not just saying it because I'm in Paris. Uh, this was probably my favorite project uh, I worked on over there. It's a series of note cards 
uh, really heavily inspired by the wrought iron work that the Art Deco wrought iron work around Paris. Um, so this was a lot of fun because obviously we only wanted to work in one color um, and all the detail and all the kind of interest came from the detail work. Um, which was obviously a lot of fun. Um, also, at one point, it was time to rebrand because she ran out of business cards. I am not joking. That's when she decided it was time to change her logo. Uh, but I, I got to, uh, I got to design Louis Feely's logo, which was probably the 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 biggest treat for me um, to design the logo of my my sort of hero. Anyway. It was a great experience, but uh, it wasn't all great, especially towards the end, um, mostly because I realized at one point that my own personal work was starting to look really similar to her work. Um, so on the left, you see a birth announcement I made for my, my nephew. Uh, thankfully, nobody outside the family had to see it because it's like, like basically plagiarism of something Louise did, even though... I was not even looking at that. It's just her aesthetic was so internalized by that point. Um, and we had such a good chemistry that um, that I feel like I, I, I sort of lost my, myself within her work and within her aesthetic. So it was time for a change. So I, I sort of spent the, the following few months, I gave notice and we have a fairly long notice period at LFL um, just because it's such a small studio. Um, so it was several months that I had time to kind of continue exploring my own work and kind of going back to what interested me around lettering and around type um, before kind of really hyper-focusing on, on historical lettering and kind of exploring different visual languages. I told myself that my one challenge for the, the, the months that I was doing all this work was, and all of this is basically 90% self-initiated, um, was to do something at a detail that Luis would not necessarily approve of, uh, just so I could push myself kind of to find my own voice that wasn't necessarily the same as, as my, my old bosses. Eventually, by doing all this experimentation, I ended up on uh, a, a personal project that um, helped me immensely as I transitioned to freelance. So um, for a while, I did um, a series of travel-inspired mosaic illustration, typographic mosaic illustrations, which like, I don't know, you have to be on Instagram to even sort of understand why it would even make sense to make a project like this. I try to explain it to some family members when they see it, and they're like, oh, I saw that thing you did, and they don't really get it. Um, <laughs> I'm like, no, believe me, like people kind of like it, so it's okay. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit, um, for the majority of, of the remainder of my time here, I want to talk a little bit about this series because it was so sort of instrumental to, um, to my career as a freelance designer. So obviously, um, digital or even mosaic illustrations are not something I invented, and I want to be very clear about that. Um, this is a poster I looked at every day uh, when I stepped into Luis's office. It's a poster she did for the School of Visual Arts, um, the same subway poster but a couple of years before, where she, um, she, had, uh, she had her uh, designers put together this sort of amazingly realistic digital kind of mosaic. Also, so in addition to that, I was working on these books that Luis does. Um, if you're not familiar with them, she, she has published at this point three books of signage from different European cities and countries. So uh, this one is uh, Grafica de las Ramblas, and it's uh, the signs of Barcelona. Um, and this one is uh, the signs of Paris. So. Um, while working on these books, I had to spend hours and hours and hours uh, sort of, as you can imagine, digitally restoring, aka photoshopping, um, these signs so that they would be fit for publication. A sign like this, I've never seen this in real life. If anybody knows where this is, let me know. But um, a sign like this uh, is probably quite large, so she had to photograph it in different stages. Every photograph had a different light, um, so stitching it together was an absolute nightmare. But what it did accomplish was uh, 
a very sort of uh, a facility on my part to recreate missing pieces of mosaics. If something was obscured by scaffolding, I could easily sort of just recreate that piece. And that eventually led to, um, to the first kind of like completely self-initiated um, uh, fosaic. They weren't called fosaics at the time. They were just called this thing I do. Um, and uh, so this was the first uh, Fosaic that I made, which was in response to um, to an Instagram sort of like call to entries for this group called uh, Typism that did a letter where you live um, contest, I guess. So you just had to simply letter where you lived. And as I was deciding how to do that, um, I, I lived in the Kipps Bay of Na uh, Kipps Bay neighborhood of, of New York, so it's really close to the Empire State Building, which is this uh, sort of one of the most famous Art Deco architect pieces of architecture um, in the city, but also in the world. So I knew I wanted an Art Deco style, but uh, when I was thinking about how to convey that, I told myself, so how do people kind of represent, how do people think of place online? Like how do people communicate a feeling of being somewhere online? And at the time, and this is a couple years ago, and maybe people still do it now, um, there was the shoe selfie that was sort of, a ubiquitous uh, marker of place for someone on social media. Um, and that was fascinating because nobody was really using that as a canvas to show something. It was mostly just a canvas to show off your shoes and the fact that you were in a specific place. So uh, this, sign, this mosaic that I had seen in London maybe a year or two before came to mind. Uh, I had originally been really drawn to the pattern in the background, which now that I've seen a lot of mosaics is nothing special, but it's still pretty cool. Um, so I decided to incorporate that into uh, into this piece. It, it had a, you know, it did it did really well. So I decided to do another one. Already, you can see the the sort of the illusion is a lot more believable. I was starting to get a technique down a little bit more. And um, I'll just show you a close up so you can see a little bit more. And I'll run through how I actually put these together in a second. But um, this ended up being a really fun project to work on uh, because it kind of very organically merged three of my biggest interests. So I, I had obviously lettering and typography, but also decorative arts, uh, patterns, and uh, interior design, which are all things that I really, really love. So as I was thinking about one, I was as I was doing one, I was always already thinking about the next one. So anytime I visited a place or thought about a place I had visited, I would create a piece commemorating that visit, inspired by the city, inspired by my experience there, and inspired by the fact that at, uh, I only had five vacation days. At, uh, <laughs> so I had to sort of travel somehow. I also got really into um, kind of the the technique, the traditional mosaic techniques, so, um, and, and, and sort of also the traditional tiling patterns. I had gotten really familiar by just looking at them so closely when I was working on Luis's books. But, you know, for example, just, uh, just as, as, a, as a random example, this, and it actually is random, I'm not, I'm ad-libbing here. Um, but you see how in this one, for example, the, the rows of black tiles that come out of the lettering sort of all echo each other. So um, that is a classical Roman tiling technique called opus musivum, where uh, really that's just what it is. The main subject just creates this kind of ripple effect in the tiling pattern. Whereas, you know, in this one that I did when I went to Kansas City, you see a pretty standard uh, sort of tiling pattern throughout, but the white tiles have this crackly pattern, which is called op opus palladianum. So, I got really super into all these traditional techniques and names, um, so I, I became super excited to explore different, different techniques with every, new, uh, with every new piece I made. So this one is a, a pebble fosaic, so it's made out of little rocks, just not really, it's made with Photoshop. Um, and what made this project really interesting for me from the beginning was that I didn't just draw some random lettering and put squares all over it. I really wanted the lettering and the composition to be inspired and dictated by the limitations and the conventions of traditional mosaic technique. So um, when I was doing this piece uh, for Boston, I wanted something very old-fashioned, so I wanted to do a, a sort of a 
traditional kind of like ornate, like hand tooled serif type of look, bifurcated serif type of look. Uh, but of course, that level of detail is not very easy to convey with tiles. So uh, the solution ended up just being just putting like tiles at a 45 degree angle, which sufficiently communicates that style of lettering. I wasn't going to try to do anything more complicated because even though I was working with digital tiles, fake tiles, I wanted to make it as if it could be created in uh, in real life. And that pattern ended up being picked up at the top. Um, and then also um, I like to include secondary patterns also when I'm working on these. And that black and white checkerboard is really came out of just me thinking like, okay, I have black and white tiles, what can I do with them? So uh, I arranged them that way. And speaking of sort of like I, I, of secondary patterns, I like to put them in there because uh, I feel like it gives a sense of, um, it, it, it makes it sort of more realistic. I don't, I don't usually put borders that align perfectly to the edges of, of my Instagram square, just because you never usually stumble on a floor that fits Instagram perfectly. There's usually other stuff happening around it. And I really want to give the illusion that this floor could potentially continue outside of the Instagram box, and then you just chose that little section to photograph. So, um, I'm just gonna give you a quick run through of how I make these if you're interested. Um, so uh, obviously it starts with a sketch like most things do where I kind of established the look and feel of a specific piece for San Diego. I wanted to go with Art Deco, um, but honestly with most things I wanna go with Art Deco. So uh, <laughs> there's no surprise there. Um, I then, after I have my sketch, I move on to, il uh, to Illustrator fairly quickly, where I establish background patterns. I establish tile widths that you see represented by these sort of vertical rows. Um, those then get sectioned off into actual tiles. And over this I do by hand. So this I do on my uh, iPad. Um, and I just really just draw each individual tile. So here's a close-up of that. And I um, draw in imperfections for each tile. I have a library of five different styles of imperfections that I rotate. And uh, that might look like a lot close-up, but when it's zoomed out, um, it kind of just overall looks, uh, looks more realistic. I then re-import that into Photoshop, color each tile individually, um, making sure to include some variation in the colors of the tile because natural stone usually has some variation and also because tiles aren't always set at the same kind of on the same plane so the light hits them all a little bit differently. Um, yeah, I'm a lot of fun at parties, obviously. <laughs> um, so here it is close up and then I do just a little bit of texturing, a little bit of like tinting to make sure it, it all looks a little bit better. But as you see, like there isn't much else. There's just a texture thrown over it. There's no bevel and emboss. There isn't any of that stuff. Um, I like to keep things simple as you can see. Um, and then I just throw some lighting effects over the whole thing and finally I obviously add the shoes, which at first felt like kind of an, a, an inside joke to myself. like. Here's this funny thing people do. I'm going to do it for my things. But in fact, as I continued working on these, adding the shoes became my favorite part of the process. Um, well, it's true because like, to me, when you add the shoes, like if I show you what it was before, this is an illustration. Now this is like a space. This is something that has a sense of scale. It has um, a sense of just place. It's an environment, right? Even if it's a completely fake and constructed one, uh, that's the part that um, was most fascinating to me. Anyway, um, eventually uh, a lot of blogs started featuring my work, uh, mostly because I emailed them being like, hey, do you want to feature my work? But, <laughs> but no, I, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I emailed a few and then the others, the others came, um, like seven. Um, but um, so, so obviously with that came some, some social media growth and also came some professional projects. So uh, I did a lot of uh, newspaper and magazine covers in this style. Um, and I think it's interesting overall how clients uh, saw this style of sort of this thing that was happening on social media and were like, we want that, but we don't exactly know how to apply it to our product. Um, so, 
of course, with magazine covers, that's not difficult because they're just flat images. But with, uh, with other types of projects, that, that, that sort of gap was a little bit harder to bridge. And uh, some of the, I don't think that some of those other projects that I did, like a social media, or no, what was it? It was like a, yeah, it was a social media campaign that needed mosaics done in a whole bunch of different formats because obviously everything is fluid now. And I'm like, do you realize how long it takes to make these? Like, I, I can give you one. And, um, and so obviously the technique is not a good match for, for all applications. Logos obviously don't work in this style, even though a few clients have contacted me for it. This is probably my favorite editorial. Um, again, I'm not just saying it because I'm here. Um, it's, my, it's probably my favorite editorial piece that I did in this style. Uh, this was for Airbnb magazine, and they wanted me to kind of like, they wanted me, they were like, our article is about Paris at night. Like, do whatever you want. And I was like, wow. <laughs> so I dove pretty deep into sort of Art Nouveau inspiration. That big hole there is not because I left a big hole, but because they needed copy to go in there. But within that, you can see how, like, I'm very careful about how I display background tiles also. Like, here there's three rows of tiles uh, that, that contour the, the images, this is called Opus Vermiculatum. And here we have like just these overlapping or, or these concentric semicircles um, to kind of give it a, an, an overall kind of more elegant look. And for this one, it was fun because I also got to do a drop cap and these little section openers. So other applications, uh, professional like commercial applications for this series that I felt were successful, unlike some of the ones that I mentioned earlier, were, uh, were this one was one of them, uh, were when clients trusted me to sort of take this technique outside of the digital space into physical space. So this was a piece I did for Fry, a shoe, boot shoe company. Um, and they hired me to, uh, they, they saw this online, they saw a Fosaic online, and they hired me to create one for them. Um, that they would actually print sort of one-to-one -one, uh, scale and on, on floor grade vinyl and just sort of install outside of their store. So this is a real photo uh, taken outside of their store um, with, with, my, with my sort of piece. It's just a glorified sticker, really, but I think it, it, it's really an interesting way that a client saw the potential of, a, of using this technique, communicating all this heritage, all this like laborious kind of technique, in a way that's super ephemeral and easily changed and updated. So another project that was uh, super interesting, maybe my favorite one that, I do a lot of French themed things it seems, I'm noticing, uh, but uh, this was for Cezanne. It's a clothing company based here, but they just started, um, they just opened a, a store in New York City. They actually hired me to make a real mosaic with marble. And because somehow they see this stuff online and people think I can actually do real mosaics, which I cannot. So I had to partner with a uh, local mosaic uh, artisan in Midtown Manhattan, this very old Lithuanian man who um, was like, why are you involved in this process? <laughs> usually, usually I do all of this. Why do I have to listen to you? But in the end, they, they asked for more money, but they did in the end come through, and we created this floor, uh, this floor mosaic for, uh, for Suzanne's um, a New York uh, boutique. And of course, I was super excited because this was an opportunity to create something that was going to stick around for a really long time and something that was in the physical space outside of social media. But of course, there, they were happy because it would go back onto social media, which is obviously what they, what they wanted to do, right? So, um, which is fine, whatever. And it... <laughs> Instagram is just part of life now. Um, so in the end, it, it, the cool thing is that it's become one of the more Instagrammed floors in New York City, which is still kind of cool. Um, another and the, the, the last, I think, interesting application of this technique was a project I did for a salt brand, Morton Salt. Um, they told me we're doing a campaign on food waste and we want you to do something preferably something that, that looks like your mosaics. <laughs> so 
Um, I was like, I can't conceptually justify making you a digital mosaic to talk about food waste. Like, why is it a mosaic? There's like no need for it to be a mosaic. Uh, unless I make it out of vegetables that were previously discarded. So um, that sounded like a good idea when I pitched it. And <laughs> as it turns out, um, it took a lot of time, but uh, it, was also, um, it was also a really fun sort of, it was a really fun project because it was the first time I ever assembled a mosaic, even if it was made of, you know, potatoes, radishes, and beets, and, uh, daikon, because it's the whitest, cheapest vegetable I could find. Because that one, ob people don't really throw away, like daikon. Um, anyway, so that's that. So uh, this project spanned, like, I don't know, um, nine, nine months, maybe close to a year. Um, it has given me, given me a lot of work. It's been, uh, s I've, I've gotten the opportunity to collaborate with a couple, couple of people as well. Um, it's really been overall an awesome experience. It's given me the opportunity to speak a lot about it. Um, but uh, it has also kind of like created a whole bunch of other people, like a whole bunch of other people have created pieces in this, in this style, uh, which I am, uh, I'm often asked how this makes me feel, the fact that I still see these a lot online. And um, at first I probably was a little bit ticked off, but um, now I don't, I don't care. I'm, I'm very happy to see that people are interested in using this technique. People usually do it once and then they're like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> and, but it really, I see this technique in more ways than I could ever have time or desire to do with more patterns, more color palettes, more type styles than I ever have any sort of interest or time to, to really tackle. Because on the other hand, I'm not really interested in doing this type of mosaic work anymore or even really working with strictly historical typography. I was telling um, Olga, I think I was talking to you earlier, about the fact that like, I get bored really easily. And, and usually uh, that hits me at around the 10 year mark. When I've done something for about a decade, I uh, start to lose interest and start looking beyond. Um, and it sounds very sort of zen when I talk about it now, but it involves a lot of like anxiety and like crying about things. But uh, eventually I've decided that I wanted to focus more on um, on kind of slightly more kind of like experimental stuff. I still do a lot of work that uh, is inspired by Art Deco. Uh, this is a project I did for Apple um, with uh, the piece as it is and then a concept that, we, that I did with a neon sort of like element to it as well. Um, this is another project I did for Apple. You can still see the historical type reference, but I'm sort of starting to move away from that. I'm becoming much more drawn to pattern work um, and, and also more kind of like environmental kind of graphics and stuff like that. And I think that even though this might look a lot different and even this, even this that still has type in it might look a lot different than my previous work and that the work I did with mosaics, but it's really that experience that has like by reflecting on that experience, I was able to kind of understand that what I really loved about it was the environmental aspect of it and the, the opportunity to create sort of more immersive type, type of uh, design experiences. So um, I'm starting a new job on Monday uh, in-house uh, where I'm gonna be doing this type of work all day. Um, and that's why I'm moving to Paris, by the way. So um, I'm also not very good at ending these. So um, yeah, merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Congratulations on the new job. Thank you very much. Um, the the mosaics are very uh, like I guess their main way of uh, being shown to people is uh, or get to to people is Instagram. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Which is uh, on fairly small screen, and it's it's great mm. to see them, see them so big, big yeah. tonight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And appreciate yeah. The, the level of, of work Thank that you. goes into. Yeah, they into were really that. made to sort of like in the visual language of Instagram. Yeah. So um, seeing them outside of that space is always a little bit like 
destabilizing, yeah. but it is nice to see them slightly yeah. larger yeah. sometimes. Yeah. It's they were like, I guess almost life size for most of them yeah, on that actually, screen. Actually, they probably were. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. That's about the size of a tile, I think. So that's pretty life size. Yeah, wow. We need a screen on the floor so you yeah. can actually <laughs> right? like step on them. Yeah. <laughs> this kind of creates a nice, like, immersive, like. <laughs> I think uh, attention to attention to detail uh, is a shared characteristic among many people who are involved with letters. Uh, you want everything to be precisely perfect, mm -hmm. but you you take it a whole lot further. You're making, well, with the mosaics anyway, like everything precisely imperfect. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah, next exactly. level. Yeah, like, I, I guess. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, about the, like, I think it's a, even though they were two very different talks, they, they, they were a, a very good match. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, the relationship with history, like both of, like you and Dan showed that looking at the past and looking at uh, history, it's about how things look, but also, or how things looked, uh, mm -hmm. but also how they were made and mm -hmm. like the technical yeah, and yeah, the, the yeah. process is, is very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, about the Fosex uh, project, like it's very much self-initiated, yeah, right? And, and you completely. showed very well how it developed into what client work became. and, and mm -hmm. your own, yeah. Uh, I guess, this looks great, like uh, you, like uh, you have this very fun uh, personal project, and suddenly it becomes your work. Uh, <laughs> is that also uh, were you at some point concerned that the the work, like work, can also ruin things, like the deadline? That it did yeah, it um, yeah, I, I guess so. In a way, I think I was uh, when it started becoming work. Yeah. Um, I was more concerned with becoming. I think eventually becoming pigeonholed into mm. a specific type yeah. of shtick it's a specific thing that everybody it's the clients always wanted i i became more afraid with like being the the mosaic guy uh, that i didn't really it didn't really yeah. feel i think uh, some clients had didn't have really an understanding of the process mm. because of course it's a process that i kind of like threw together so how could they but they didn't oftentimes didn't understand that i was actually drawing yeah. each tile sort of individually that each one took you know, at least 24 hours of work generally. So, um, so sometimes they would say, you know, we want this in a week, and I would be like, that's actually impossible for me to do. Or we want this for $500, and I'm like, that means you're paying me like $2 an hour, and that's not gonna work. <laughs> so aside from those small kind of like when the budget was okay and when the timeline was okay, it never really sort of yeah, felt like yeah. work until it sort of globally felt like work, yeah. like until the visual, the sort of that technique, kind of like I had done enough yeah. and I was ready cool. to move yeah. on. Cool. Uh, like the the mosaics themselves are, are display a very wide diversity of, of style, but you also showed how much your work your work is uh, much more than the mosaics and, mm -hmm. and yeah. And so you. Yeah, you show the great variety of of, uh, of work, like lettering styles, but also like the whole the, the patterns and the colors, and and yet somehow they all feel very much your own. Like you have your own voice that is yours, and yet you have a this voice has a very wide range. I'm like gonna take your word for that because <laughs> I don't really see a ton of pattern in my work except literal pattern, obviously, yeah. but. Dave, um, I was I was hoping you could uh, tell, tell us how, how you do that, but uh, I can't because I, I I I do I sometimes think my work is very sort of scattered and a little bit all over the place. I think my the type of the type of type I'm interested in um, is wide, but also not enormous. Like I tend to have I I tend to have a sort of a. Uh, like uh, sort of a pref a soft spot spot in my heart for uh, early twentieth century type. So uh, a lot of my work is either are inspired by Art Deco or Art Nouveau. So um, possibly that's can that creates a sort of sense of continuity. Even the weird Apple stuff I did still feels like it could be kind of a newer version of Art Deco, even yeah. though it's a little bit weirder. But um, I think that may maybe could be yeah. could oh, be yeah. what's helping that feeling. It, it it definitely feels like informed by history and very much of, of today at the same awesome. time. Yeah, so I'm happy to like hear that. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Okay, I'll go at the back first. And then I'll get back to you. Hi, Nick. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you told us about uh, when you were a student, you were really into lettering. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if there was a moment uh, in your career when you thought like maybe type design would be like a next step for you. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I don't know, maybe when you're working on a lettering for packaging or something, have you ever thought like, Let's this just lettering make it should a be a typeface. Yeah. Do um, you think it, this could happen for you? You know, I tried. Um, I've t I took maybe I've taken like one or two type design workshops. Yeah. Um, I it's it's just not for me. Um, <laughs> it's I mean I, I I like I like the t the level of detail. Um, but even though I make stuff like that, the level of detail type designers have is beyond my comprehension. I mean, it's, yeah, you shake your head, but it's true. Um, so, and also just, um, I think I have done a couple things that I was like, I could make this into a font. And it's, it, it's just been added to the list of like, projects I, I could do, <laughs> uh, but somehow I never get around to it. So I'm guessing I probably won't until something more drastic kind of changes or I definitely get sort of into doing it. but. Um, I did work on some fonts while I was um, at Luis's yeah. towards the end of my time there. She got really into type design. Um, so I did assist her with some of that. But um, of my own sort of making from start to finish, I have a couple kind of like projects and glyphs, uh, but nothing concrete, no. Okay. I don't, I mean, I think for some people it might be a natural next step from lettering, but uh, for me it sort of felt like a related but distinct uh, discipline, I guess. Okay, thank you. My pleasure, thank you for your question. Did you, Scott, did you have one? Should I wait for the microphone? Yeah, all right. Uh, I was just curious how you uh, made the jump from, obviously these fosaics are just fucking phenomenal, and now that you're moving onwards to uh, we work. I'm just curious how you made the jump from like ending that project and the transition into, you know, making more of the pattern work and all this other stuff um, that is like the next part of your career, I guess. Um, uh, just talk a little bit about that and, and how you even came to that conclusion of like what, you know, reaching that point, I guess. So, um, I mean, it's not a pretty story just because like I realize you know it's not easy when you sort of like have worked really hard to get to a specific point in your career um you've invested a lot of time and energy um sort of thinking that's what you wanted and then when at a certain point either gradually or more suddenly you realize maybe this is not a hundred percent what i want um right or right now maybe i need to take a break from it for a little while so i would like to tell you that there was a process in there but really there was just kind of I think it coincided with me moving away from New York, kind of being removed from that environment. I found myself just not doing lettering anymore um, at that, in that way, just really doing it for the clients when, you know, to keep sort of the money coming in, obviously. But um, I found myself disengaging from, uh, from social media um, and just really kind of like floundering and questioning like what it is that I want to do. Am I, you know, should I just go to move to like Costa Rica to, to like save the turtles or like <laughs> should I do, which I might still do. Um, but um, eventually, um, yeah, mostly I was just sort of like anxious and not knowing what to do for a while, like for a, about a six month period. Um, and then I, um, I sort of, um, started thinking about what it is I liked about my Fosaic project and what it is that made me excited about it and um, came to the conclusion that sort of the, what I mentioned earlier that kind of it was the fact that it was maybe more of an environmental type of thing that it was an opportunity to kind of maybe have an impact on so I have this one memory of like when I was in 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 this in New York and feeling like really down about something. I walked into this cafe and there was this huge William Morris wallpaper and it completely transformed my mood. Like all of a sudden I was much more relaxed. I don't know. I just really love wallpaper and 
have like the fact that it had that effect on me, I was like, you know, spaces are powerful and the, the visuals of spaces are powerful. Um, and uh, that, that realization coincided with me seeing uh, an opening um, at, um, at WeWork and, um, and then kind of being like, yeah, why not? So, um, so that's pretty much what that looked like for me. It's a very candid answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, that was pretty amazing talk. So thank you, thank you for that. Thanks like so very much. helpful and entertaining. Uh, and uh, I really wonder what is your idea making process? I mean, uh, before you start even ruminate over the idea or start the realization, do you use like any references or not? Does it something that just pops up in your head like so i've gotten a project like that? i've gotten contacted by a client they've like signed a contract and now like what's the next step like in my no, head no maybe probably more on your personal projects mm. i i'm interested we yeah. we saw like the part of your commercial process yeah. today but i wonder like I don't like. I don't really have a, a sort of idea generating sort of method that I use for every project. More often than not, I have a a rough idea within like the five, the first five to ten minutes of of getting of like really sitting down to think about a project, and then I generally commit to that idea. I'm not a big ideas person. Um, I'm more of a process person. So. Um, I really believe that oftentimes the process informs the product, and sometimes a lot of stuff can come out of the process uh, of, of just creating something. So more often than not, I'll commit to a sketch or, or a series of sketches, even if I've done it without thinking too much, uh, because through the process of working through that sketch, I'll end up with a final that's maybe completely different than the original sketch, but that's just the space I'm most comfortable in. I'm not comfortable generating ideas. Uh, I'm comfortable just working on the craft and kind of letting that lead me where I want to need to go and hopefully the client will like it. Cool. So you're just improvising a lot on the way. Yeah. Right. I'm generally <laughs> a very like pre like prepared person. I usually have notes, but then like I've been told that I'm a little robotic when I read. So, um, so yeah, I'm a lot more improvising lately. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so this question kind of builds off one you were asked earlier about uh, whether you think type design might be something you, you want to try. So the biggest difference I thought between lettering and type design is that type ty a typeface has to be consistent, but lettering gets to be contextual. Like you see the two different kinds of O's there. Mm -hmm. But you know now with the different kinds of softwares and file formats coming in for fonts, you get mm -hmm. to have so much more freedom in mm -hmm. creating contextual alternates. Mm -hmm. So that line between lettering and... Is blurring and a little yeah, bit, yeah. it's blurring. So I'm just curious to know what you think about that. Yeah. Do you I think you might ever make a typeface with like... Yeah, I mean, and that's a good clarification because um, it actually is the part of type design that excites me the most. Um, when I... Um, so while I talk, I'm going to try to bring something up. When uh, when I was working at LFL, we did a we did a font that had a lot of uh, that had a lot of alternates and a lot of ligatures. So that that part of the process was really fun, sort of figuring those out and having them be that little like surprise people get when they type out those two letters and that really cool ligature pops up. This is not that. This is a project I did on my own, and it's kind of has that similar kind of feel. I like thinking of. Oftentimes, I like thinking of type as like a puzzle and trying to fill as much of the available space as I can with type and creating like unusual ligatures are the ones that I find the most interesting and unusual type interactions. So when I did this cover for Penguin Press, I was like, maybe I should make this into a font. But then I got caught up with like, yeah, but how thick should the stroke be? And what if people want to make it smaller than like 50 500 points like they're not gonna see it and then I was just you know there's that that's a type of like really granular decision-making process with type design that I just have a really hard time with and I'm, I'm just in general really bad at making decisions so um, so I think that's what turned me off to, to that project even despite the alternates but uh, the alternates do make it much more interesting to me for sure thank you thank you 
So, hello. Uh, how, do you how do you feel about social media? Are you no, not that question. No. Yeah. <laughs> you, are you doing Fox size? Were you doing at first, I guess, for yourself? Because, oh, this, is, this yeah. looks nice, this could look nice. No, but yeah, we don't have to, like, real talk. Like, also, it was for social media. I mean, it was for myself, but obviously, there was a social media component. And how do you feel about the social media pressure? Yeah. How, how do you, considering Fox size was really uh, Instagram oriented, like, with the floors and this, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel on how you manage the social media pressure? Yeah. I think, I think, like a lot of us, I have like a love-hate relationship with Instagram, which um, recently has gone more towards hate, um, honestly. I think, I mean, I think Instagram is an amazingly powerful tool for designers. I mean, it can give unprecedented visibility to someone living across the world. Um, and um, that said, I mean, I've, I've definitely been, uh, I've experienced being someone with like a no Instagram presence, realizing it as a necessity, and working really hard to grow my Instagram presence to a point where like I'm now someone with a sizable Instagram presence and uh, sort of seeing the other side of that and being like, why am I doing this, you know? So I think, I think with social media in general, it's important to keep personal boundaries. I think that's like my main, what I've learned over the last few years. Um, I think it's important to keep your motivation in mind. So if you're like w the moment you realize, yeah, this Fosaic project, I'm doing it for me, but at this point I'm doing it mostly for the likes. That's when, you know, you maybe I'm, you know, I maybe did a couple more after that realization point, but then I was like, this needs to stop, you know, because the motivation wasn't right. Uh, also, obviously, I'm not even going to get into sort of the need for validation and all of that stuff that that kind of like breeds. But um, when I mean what I mean by personal boundaries, um, oh, what, what I lost my train of thought. Um, I'm sorry, but um, anyway, I I think it also when I was in when I was in graduate school, someone was talking about social media to us, and it wasn't Instagram at the time. Um, it might have been Tumblr, but uh, they were talking about how social media is creating a homogenization in uh, design, and I thought that was the most pretentious thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but um, I totally agree with that statement now. I mean, it, and I think a few years later, it's as true as it ever has been. So um, I think if you're able to distance yourself enough to put out uh, the work you really want to be doing and receiving in, in return from clients, uh, then I think it's totally fine, but personal boundaries are important. Cool, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, nice. There's a few in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm interested in, uh, you were talking about the craft and how long it took you to make each of these Posaics. Did you ever think actually it might be quicker or maybe even more satisfying to actually make them by hand? <laughs> and and related to that, I suppose, um, in general, do you ever feel like actually it would be more interesting to get away from the computer and, and craft things with your hands yeah. rather than on a screen? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. I think uh, more satisfying, definitely. Quicker, probably not. Um, real mosaics still take far longer than my fake ones. Um, and I am a little bit intimidated by that process. It's also very costly, but um, as far as just working with my hands, yeah, like that, that's a resounding yes for me. Like I really um, enjoy working with my hands and um, I find that I've been doing it less and less and I, I have to periodically remind myself that it's something that I really enjoy doing and that I try to get back to uh, as often as possible. Um, so definitely. And not just in design, like I, I, I think it's also really important to do other sort of other like nurture other parts of a personal creativity, like take a pottery class or something that's totally unrelated because I feel like it creates like interesting intersections. Yeah, I, I go to a pottery class and it's full of graphic designers. Oh, really? No <laughs> way. I guess that wasn't so unusual, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you said earlier, like with your harp playing days and 
um, you, you said that you've got like a love for intense, like painstaking processes. And I was just wondering if you've always had that creative patience because I feel like I'm losing mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I did. I think I have. I mean, I think actually um, studying music um, intensely uh, sort of nurtures that type of patience. I mean, uh, a lot of what you... S I mean, music is primarily what you don't see. Like, the majority of your life is spent practicing for just a, a very short performance. So the idea of sitting down with a craft and just having to do it for, like, two hours, like, just playing scales for an hour a day, it's it's boring, but you find joy in it. So after, after some time. Um, so I think that prepared me well to... Uh, and, and applied well also to the type of work that I'm interested in with design. I don't think it's necessarily something you're born in or born with or not. I think it's something that you sort of, uh, you sort of work towards maybe. And uh, I find it wavering sometimes also, especially- Especially with Instagram and Exactly, all that stuff. yeah. With like things just, even when I was first doing these, I was like, it's taking me like, like 20 hours of work to do this and it's up for like 20 seconds and then that's it. Like it makes you, you know, it, it makes you not want to invest that, that amount of time in something, but then it goes back to sort of the motivation behind it. So like, we're really not doing this always for the final product. We're also doing it because we enjoy the process of doing it and the process of making. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of what I try to focus on every once in a while. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. I think that might be it or That's it? One more? Oh, of course. There's always a question by Jean Francois. Oh, no. <laughs> this one is very special. It's special? not the usual question. I, I take some risk asking the question. OK. Even, I yeah, might not answer, but yeah. I probably will. <laughs> OK, because I've, I've heard this afternoon that you will be in Paris for for in def yeah for the foreseeable future yeah for for a couple of couple of years so it you will be there next next year correct okay um i take a lot of risk asking this question like publicly yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mean <laughs> um i was vis visiting uh, louis philly you will understood my question very quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. in february in new york mm -hmm. and um we discussing together uh, again, and uh, I ask uh, her, uh, will, you, will you come to Thai Paris next year to do a talk, to do a workshop? So my question is, are you happy to be Mathieu next year with Louis Philly here? Ah, ben, avec plaisir. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>